Our next presenter is Dr. Monica Perales, and Mike already introduced her, so without further ado. Okay, well, uh, no pressure following uh, that wonderful presentation by uh, <laughs> Professor Kennedy. Um, again, uh, you know, it, it really is a delight to be a part of these um, these institutes, and in particular to talk about what it is that I do, uh, Mexican American history. I've uh, encountered a number of teachers in these institutes. I've been doing these for a few years now, and invariably, teachers come up to me and ask, you know, how can I incorporate more Mexican American history into uh, what it is that I do? Not only is it a requirement that is imposed on you by the state to include more information about the Mexican American experience, um, but I find that, that a lot of teachers talk to me about their own students. Right, and the, and the ways in which they can engage their students or, or try to engage their students, right? You know, that, that often they hear, well, you know, I, I never see my history in the textbook, and how does this relate to me? I don't, I, I can't make the connection. And so my hope is that in uh, the, the brief time that we have here together uh, today and in the primary source workshops this afternoon, that we can think of some ways to, to be able to do this. Uh, now, at the risk of immediately becoming the least popular session of the day, I thought we might do something a little bit different to kind of get things moving. Um, and I, I thought we might start um, with, with a pop quiz, actually. Um, don't worry, it won't be graded, and uh, I'll actually give you some of the answers as we move along. But I thought this might be a, a, a good way to kind of get things, get things flowing for today. And so the, there's really only one question. Uh, can you identify the following figures in Mexican American history? And can you give a brief description of the individual's historical significance? So I'll start. Cesar Chavez. Cesar Chavez. Okay, see, I told you this wasn't going to be too hard. Why is Cesar Chavez important to Mexican American history? What, what do we know about him? What do you know about him? What do you tell your students about him? <laughs> Or a labor organizer organizing farm workers uh, and and uh, trying to secure better better working conditions, better rights, better pay for uh, for uh, farm workers, a historically um, unorganized uh, group of workers. Okay. Does anybody know who this gentleman is? Uh, Hector P. Garcia? Yes, Dr. Hector P. Dr. Garcia. Garcia. Yes. Um, a very distinguished looking gentleman there. What do we know? Why, why is Hector P. Garcia significant in Mexican American history? Secured rights for Hispanics, for Mexican Americans who had come back from the war, secured their rights in better hospitals and better Right, right. So Dr. Garcia was a medical doctor, actually served in the military during World War II, um, and focused on the rights of veterans, uh, Mexican-American veterans coming back from World War II, who had a very difficult time getting the VA to respond to their needs. Um, but it was more than that. He also recognized that there were a number of other challenges that Mexican-American communities faced in particular questions of racial discrimination, lack of access to good health care. Um, he uh, founded the American GI Forum, a, a, a civil rights organization that is still around today. Um, he also played a pivotal role in securing burial of uh, private Felix Longoria at Arlington National Cemetery. That's another um, uh, individual who I don't have, have pictured here today. Um, but another case involving um, discrimination of private Longoria was killed in, in action in the Philippines, and he was from Three Rivers, Texas. Um, unfortunately, uh, the custom at the time was uh, racial segregation. Uh, Mexican Americans were not uh, included in the civic life of, of the city. Uh, he was, long story short, uh, there was a controversy about having a wake for Private Longoria at the funeral home. and. Uh, Hector P. Garcia was instrumental in appealing to Lyndon Johnson, who was serving in Congress at the time, uh, and got Longoria buried at Arlington National Cemetery. There's a great new documentary that just came out about this called The Longoria Affair. Um, I believe it's a PBS uh, uh, American Experience film. So Hector P. Garcia. How about this lovely woman? <coughs> Dolores Huerta. And what do we know about Dolores Huerta? Also, 
She uh, was also an, an educator and an activist, a labor organizer, worked in the fields as well. Uh, she was the co-founder with Cesar Chavez of the United Farm Workers Union, instrumental in getting, as you mentioned, the, the great boycott uh, started and, and, uh, and succeeding with the great boycott in, in getting uh, contracts signed with um, some of the major growers in California. How about these gentlemen? Does anybody have any guess as to who these gentlemen might be? Aha, I stumped the crowd. Good. Well, actually, I'm going to come back to these, these gentlemen uh, at, at the end of my talk. But, uh, you know, as I was reviewing the standards, and it, it you know, obviously they're, they've been revised and they are, they are revised periodically, and each time it seems to be that there's something new to cover, that there's more material that you have to incorporate into your already very full, very packed schedules. Um, and you have to do it in a short amount of time. And so what I wanted to do today was to highlight some of the individuals, and, and as you recall and as you know, uh, Hector P. Garcia, Dolores Huerta, Cesar Chavez are all names that, that appear on those standards. But also in reviewing these revised standards, I noticed that, that you have quite a bit of ground to cover as well. You have to focus on these individuals and make sure students understand who they are and why they're important. But there's also uh, several court cases that are important. Hernandez v. Texas, and I believe Mendez v. Westminster is also a case that appears on your um, on your standards and, and, and in terms of things you have to do. Um, and there's also major events that are important in Mexican American history that are, have also been incorporated into your new standards. Uh, repatriation drives of the 1930s uh, coming out of the Great Depression. Um, also the Chicano mural movement. So uh, you, you, you're trying to cover a great deal of time and a great deal of information. Um, and, and it's certainly a very difficult task. Uh, for those of us who teach Mexican American history and have an entire semester to do this, that's a pretty, pretty big task to do, but it's, it's even more difficult in your situation. Now, as somebody who focuses on Mexican American history, I think that there are any number of ways that you can carve up this experience in the 20th century. How are we going to approach? What are the, the topic of Mexican American history? How are we going to, to carve it up and, and be able to to sort of have an overarching theme so that, that the pieces are connected. Um, and so what I wanted to do today was to think in these kind of conceptual lines. How is it that you can hit all of these different marks, connect all of these different dots for students in a way that is um, that, that it's both meaningful, right, in terms of, of providing content, but also in a way that connects Mexican American history to many of the other things that you are already discussing in, in your, your classrooms. Um, you know, how do we place the Mexican American experience into this larger context um, in a way that enhances what you already do and, and allows students to kind of recognize their own history as part of, uh, of the, the greater story of US history. And so what I want to do today is provide you this kind of conceptual framework. Um, rather than, than you know, sort of overload you with lots of names and dates, um, I kind of wanted to provide this kind of sweeping framework that, that can, might be able to help you think about how to incorporate this into your classroom. And what I came up with were sort of three main points, three kind of big takeaway points that I think students should have when thinking about Mexican American history. Um, and in doing it, hitting these three points, you'll also be getting at the, the specifics that the standards require. The first point uh, that I think is really critical for students to understand um, is the meanings, the multiple meanings, of citizenship. And note that citizenship is in quotation marks, and I'll, I'll explain that in just a moment. Um, but also the limits of this kind of idea, this notion of citizenship. The second major theme or issue is the long struggle for equality. Um, I think often we uh, kind of look at current events and we, we think about Mexican American history as being something very recent. Uh, and in particular, when we, we kind of focus on the events of the 1960s and 70s, you know, th this is a, a pretty short view of history. But actually, Mexican American history is much longer. Um, and the struggle, this long struggle for equality and for civil rights is one that stretches back many years. And I think this is where we can kind of make these important connections. 
And the final point is to think about the ways in which Mexican American history is US history. Um, rather than, than treating it as something that's separate, that's something that detracts from our understanding of the larger narrative of US history, that really it's, it's very much integral to, to the, the evolution of our, our country and of the um, ideals that it, um, that it possesses and espouses. So getting to the first point, the meanings of citizenship, um, and again in quotation marks, and its limits. When we think about citizenship, we can think about it in its most basic sense, right? The very basic idea behind citizenship um, is it's a legal designation, right? It, it denotes formal membership in a nation state. Um, it's a matter of what side of the line one was born on, whether or not someone has undergone the process of naturalization. It's a very basic kind of legalistic way of thinking about citizenship. But the way that I think it's important to think about with regard to Mexican American history and really in, in US history more, more generally, is that citizenship is only in part a legal designation. That there's a lot of different ways in which to conceive of, of national belonging, of, of identity, how one sees oneself. Um, and there's also ways in which citizenship is viewed about other people, right? So, so it's about not just how one views oneself, but by how uh, one is viewed by others. And this is particularly salient when we think about the history of US Latinos. Um, it's a, an incredibly complex issue, and, and it really it's a, an issue that when we talk about the civil rights movement, uh, one that's not a foregone conclusion, right? You know, if citizenship were as simple as, um, you know, what it says on a, on a piece of paper, then we wouldn't have had to have had, you know, this, this very long struggle over civil rights, not just for African Americans, but for, for other groups as well. When we think about U.S. Latinos, when we think about Mexican Americans, um, we have to recognize that it is a diverse population. Um, on the one hand, it is composed of individuals, uh, of a part of long-standing communities, people with generations-long histories uh, in the regions of the Southwest, people that, um, for whom the, the border moved and created citizens out of them. Um, but it's also an immigrant population uh, with, with a very recent immigration history. And in fact, at any given point in the 20th century, uh, we have a very mixed population that includes people who are citizens that are native born, uh, people who are naturalized citizens, as well as undocumented residents, old and new communities. And so I think it's, it's critical to kind of complicate this idea of what citizenship is. In addition, when we think about citizenship and its relationship to, in particular, U.S. Latinos, um, they have historically been a group that, regardless of their time in the United States, regardless of their long historic ties to places like Texas and New Mexico and California, they've been a group that has been viewed and perceived as foreign, um, as not having a legal status, and, and this is something that I think is critical uh, in the struggle for civil rights. Uh, much of this has to do with a very precarious and tricky racial designation and a racial status that uh, Latinos hold in the United States, and here I want to talk specifically about Mexican Americans. Um, Mexican Americans in US history have historically been considered to be Caucasian, technically white, legally white. Um, so the Jim Crow laws that apply to African Americans didn't necessarily apply to Mexican Americans in the same way. However, this isn't to say that there weren't other ways of seeing this group as being, um, as being racially other, as being suspect. Uh, factors like national, naturalization status, color, language, class, all of these things work together to kind of create this kind of suspect citizenship, uh, this kind of marker of racial difference among US Latinos. It's important to not just think about how citizenship is denied, right, or, or kind of seen as, as not belonging to this group, um, but also how individuals view themselves, right? To think about how Mexicans uh, conceive of and define their own sense of self, their own sense of belonging. Um, and here I think it's, it's critical to, um, to engage these kind of cultural elements of citizenship. The ways in which marginalized communities uh, 
sort of draw on their histories and claim um, a, a kind of uh, sense of, of, of rights and citizenship based on cultural aspects and, a, and an affirmation of cultural identity um, as another way of thinking about citizenship. Now, all of that background, uh, I think, kind of helps us to think about, in a broader sense, the experiences of Mexican Americans uh, in the United States in the 20th century, um, and this kind of tension between uh, rights and um, responsibilities, and also those rights that are denied. One way that I find is especially useful in terms of engaging my students is to use visual images and to, to kind of have students look at these, um, these photographs and, and images to really kind of grapple with what it means to be a citizen and, and, and the challenges that uh, different groups encounter. One of my favorite uh, images to use is, is one that often surprises students. Students are very familiar with these signs across the Jim Crow South. Uh, sort of denoting public spaces meant for African Americans and for, uh, for white patrons. Um, and some of them are very surprised when they see signs like this. Uh, this was a sign from Texas, uh, 1949, um, a part of the Russell Lee photograph collection here at the Center for American History. Um, and, and to see signs, you know, what does this mean, right? To ask students, you know, what, what do they, they think about these, these uh, images? Um, another uh, photograph from Russell Lee kind of speaks to, you know, sort of the, the everyday uh, surroundings that Mexicans found themselves in. Um, throughout the Southwest and beyond, Mexicans encounter discrimination in a variety of forms. Um, to me, I think one of the things that I like to get students to think about here um, is the disparity, right? To, to offer, you know, a, a sort of an image of what it means to be a citizen um, and what it means to be seen as not a citizen. Uh, Mexican Americans found themselves locked in low paying, low skilled jobs, often regardless of their experience or education. Uh, restrictive covenants, <laughs> limited access to certain neighborhoods, um, but more often than not, the economic conditions that Mexicans found themselves in uh, kept them locked in barrios, uh, in cities where uh, there were few services, including sanitation services and plumbing. Many times, this segregation was enforced by custom, which could be as powerful as the segregation enforced by law. Uh, it, you know, there are stories across the Southwest and, and really in other parts of the countries where, country where Mexican Americans uh, sort of established themselves of uh, examples that, were very, that, that resonate very much with the African American experience. Swimming pools, public swimming pools that did not allow access to, to Mexican patrons except on the day before the swimming pool was drained. These uh, kinds of boundaries, these social and racial boundaries, um, were very stark and were a reality. And in some cases, were supported and bolstered by local customs and everyday practices, uh, but sometimes reinforced by violence. The Texas Rangers notoriously um, you know, sort of used violence as a means of, of maintaining separation. And of course, schools also were a place where segregation of Mexicans um, also occurred. This is an image from um, LULAC, uh, the uh, civil rights organization that was founded here in Texas in the 1920s, um, in which you have one of the, um, the LULAC officials pointing to the sewer line, uh, which is not very far from the outhouse. The outhouse was the only facilities, were the only facilities available in the Mexican school. Um, and here he is pointing to the fact that the, the city sewer line runs not too far from, from where that um, the Mexican privy was. And more, because Mexicans were considered technically, legally white, um, this kind of segregation was not necessarily about race per se, but rather how race kind of fused things like language and a perceived lack of intelligence. This kind of justified the separation of Mexican children into so-called Mexican schools, uh, whose facilities were vastly inferior to those of neighboring Anglo schools. And so again, I think these images are, are a really uh, important way of um, kind of getting students to see in a visual sense the, the difference between the rights that are available to different groups of people. 
And if we think about citizenship and, and the, the limits of citizenship and the perception of illegality or the perception of foreignness, this helps us get to a discussion of the repatriation drives of the 1930s. Uh, Professor Kennedy spoke very powerfully about the unemployment and uh, the unemployment rates in the 1930s during the Great Depression. Um, and, and this very much led to the scapegoating of individuals believed to be um, taking jobs that could go to, um, to American workers. Um, it's estimated that as many as 600,000 people of Mexican descent repatriated during the 1930s. Uh, some of these were uh, the result of uh, drives, actual uh, concerted deportation drives, um, and others were so-called voluntary repatriation. Um, you know, families who simply could not find work, um, families who encountered harassment um, in, in, uh, in cities and, and uh, decided to try their, um, their fortune elsewhere. Um, the interesting thing is that a vast majority of these repatriates, um, in fact, were U.S. citizens by birth. Uh, many of them were the children who had been born in the United States who were citizens by virtue of their birth. So by thinking about citizenship, what it means, um, how it functions, um, and the ways in which citizenship is denied, I think leads us to the second main point, uh, which is to talk about the long struggle for equality. Again, many of the individuals that are part of the standards um, kind of focus on a little bit later in the 20th century, right? We have the, uh, the farm worker movement, which is a, a very important movement for, for rights, for workers' rights, but also civil rights in the 1960s and 70s. But it's a much longer history, um, as suggested to us uh, by the presence of Hector P. Garcia. Um, in fact, uh, labor activism and workers' rights is, is a critical area um, you know where we see the mobilization around questions of, uh, of of question of rights, and this history goes back into the early 20th century, um, as early as the 19 teens, and even before 19 teens. In 1903, um, Mexican workers, Mexican miners in Clifton, Morency, Arizona, are organizing for better working conditions um, and for access to um, to equal jobs, equal access to to good paying jobs at the um, Arizona Copper uh, Mining Companies. In the 1930s, using a different approach, uh, using radical politics as her framework, uh, Emma Tenayuca organized San Antonio's pecan shellers to strike for better wages and working conditions. Um, Emma Tenayuca also pointed to the fact that it wasn't just about worker rights, but it was a larger pattern of racial discrimination and a second tier citizenship um, that, that affected Mexicans living in Texas. Um, and for her, it wasn't even about whether one was a citizen or not, right? It was this kind of question of, of human rights in many ways. Kind of going back to this kind of idea of cultural citizenship and the way that citizenship and belonging, national belonging, um, can be articulated, um, I like to include uh, so also some, some artwork and other kinds of, of materials in my classes. And I've used this particular mural by Juana Alicia um, that's in San Francisco. It's called Las Lechugueras, or the, the Lettuce Pickers. Um, and here she's articulating a very different kind of sense of rights. Um, this particular uh, mural shows uh, workers, many of them women, in fact, one of the, the prominent um, uh, sort of figures on this particular uh, mural is a, a pregnant woman working in the fields. Um, and here kind of pointing to the terrible conditions, not only the working conditions, but the crop duster that is spraying pesticides over the workers as well. Um, so here we're talking about citizenship in a much broader sense, right? These kinds of basic rights um, that are also expressed in, in this way. Another area where we see the push for civil rights and this kind of concern about citizenship and, and its meanings and fulfillment um, is in the area of educational equality. Um, the groups like the League of United Latin American Citizens um, and other grassroots organizations, grassroots parents organizations, uh, challenging segregation of Mexican children uh, working to dismantle the architecture uh, that, that, that was segregation. And, and many of these cases are very much connected to the African American experience. Uh, some of these set the groundwork for important cases um, and ultimately leading um, up to Brown v. Board of Education. 
And the final area is this kind of question of, of civil rights more generally and, and kind of basic um, access, you know, things like voter registration, things like, um, you know, getting uh, people elected to, to office. Um, you know, these are, are really important rights that are, are also fought for. Um, thinking again about the, um, the American GI Forum here. Uh, one of the cases that I like to talk about, and conveniently, it's one that you have to cover in the standards, if I can get the thing to move, is Hernandez v. Texas. Um, and, and what I really like about Hernandez v. Texas is that it is a case that um, is, is really powerful. It really gets to the heart of the meaning of citizenship and what it means to be a citizen and to to be able to, to do one's civic duty, um, although it's one that, that's kind of hard to, to really kind of rally behind because um, it's about jury duty. And I find that it's really difficult to get people excited about fulfilling their civic duty um, by going and, and sitting in jury duty. But this case is fundamentally important because it speaks to this question of what are the rights and responsibilities of a citizen? What does it mean to have those rights denied? Now, the case of Hernandez v. Texas um, is actually a, a kind of an interesting case. It's, it starts with a murder case. Uh, Pete Hernandez, the defendant who is, is pictured here in the middle, um, got into a bar fight in a small town called Edna. And uh, he, he went into a bar, got into a fight with a man by the name of Joe Espinoza. Uh, witnesses say that Pete Hernandez then left the bar, came back with a, with a gun, and shot Joe Espinoza dead. There was no question about his guilt. Um, you know, it was clear that, that he had, had uh, you know, done the crime and that there was no question about, uh, you know, the, the guilt. But this was not what made the case so interesting. Civil rights attorneys were looking for a case to challenge the fact that in many counties in Texas, a Mexican juror had never been seated. Um, in Jackson County, uh, one had not been seated in 25 years. Now, the state of Texas argued that because Mexicans were Caucasian, that Pete Hernandez had actually had a jury of his peers. Um, this jury tried him uh, in the space of a day. The, the case took, took, uh, took place over the, case, uh, the course of one day. Uh, by the end of the day, he was found guilty and sentenced to 99 years in prison. But not a, a single Mexican juror had sat on his case um, or on any case in the past 25 years. And so the case makes its way. The appeal is really where the, the importance of this case lies. Um, and the case you know, is, is uh, taken on by uh, attorney Gus Garcia and a couple of other attorneys from Houston uh, named John Guerrera and James De Anda. And they did statistical research to show uh, the ways in which Mexican Americans had been systematically ex excluded from grand juries and pettit juries in the state of Texas. Interestingly, uh, these attorneys had to drive back to Houston every night after, um, you know, sort of doing their job because it was not safe to be Mexican in Edna after dark. And another interesting point, uh, in the very courthouse where the state of Texas was arguing that Pete Hernandez had gotten a fair trial, a jury of his peers, uh, there was a sign over the men's restroom that read, Colored Men, Hombres Aquí. So in the very courthouse where they're arguing that there is no discrimination against Mexican Americans, uh, there is this sign, the attorneys who were who are, uh, defending Pete Hernandez couldn't even use the restroom. The case makes its way all the way up to the Supreme Court. And in, this was significant for a number of reasons. This is the first time Mexican American lawyers argue a case before the US Supreme Court. Um, but it also gets on the record the experience and the history of discrimination against Mexican Americans in the state of Texas. And really what they're arguing for is a more capacious understanding of the 14th Amendment. Uh, that although uh, Mexican Americans are legally white, that they are seen as a distinct class, particularly in the state of Texas. Chief Justice Earl Warren ruled, uh, gave the decision of the court on May 3rd, 1954, uh, just about two weeks before Brown v. Versus, ver, bleh, Brown v. <laughs> Brown versus Board of Education. Um, and this is what he had to say. Uh, the ruling was, the petitioner did not seek proportional representation, nor did he claim a right to have persons of Mexican descent sit on the particular juries which he faced. His only claim is the right to be indicted and tried by juries from which all members of his class 
are not systematically excluded. Juries selected from among all qualified persons, regardless of national origin or descent. To this much, he is entitled by the Constitution. So again, a very significant case because it, it shows that this history, uh, this denial of citizenship, this kind of lack of citizenship and the recognition thereof um, is something significant, right? And so in this way, um, you know, it, it sort of dovetails with the larger discussions of civil rights that, that you cover in your classroom already. Uh, on a side note, Pete Hernandez uh, got a new trial he was reconvicted. This time, uh, there were two Mexican Americans serving on the jury, um, and he was sentenced to 20 years in prison. Again, he did it. Nobody had a doubt about that. So this brings me to my final conclusion point, which is Mexican American history as US history. Um, again, I, I hope that by using this kind of framework and thinking about the multiple meanings of citizenship and, and the struggles to really kind of bring to fruition the, the <coughs> full meanings of that citizenship um, is a story that is fundamentally a part of U.S. history. Um, and that is fundamentally a, a, a Mexican-American story, it's an African-American story, it's a women's history story, um, it's a Native American history story. And so I think that, that we really kind of see how these are all very much connected. And so on first glance, it seems like the standards are asking you to do quite a lot, and, and they probably are. Um, but I think by, by kind of conceiving of Mexican-American history as yet another uh, layer of the story, that it's possible to incorporate these um, in really in important ways. And so this brings me back to the slide of the gentleman at the beginning. Um, and that's my grandfather um, and his father, uh, Macario. Um, my grandfather was born in El Paso, Texas in 1924. As a young boy, he probably witnessed the uh, repatriation. El Paso had become um, where it was initially the major point of entry into the United States uh, during the 19-teens and 1920s, during the Mexican Re Revolution and the boom in um, uh, sort of uh, industry that, that drew Mexican workers into the United States, men like his father. Um, he saw it turn into the major point of exodus uh, during the repatriation drives. Uh, in 1943, just shy of his uh, graduation from high school, he quit his job and went to work at American Smelting and Refining Company, ASARCO, the big copper smelter there in town. His dad already worked there. Um, he joined the military, went off to war during World War II, broke his elbow jumping out of an airplane. Uh, came back, joined the Veterans of Foreign Wars. That particular chapter consisted entirely of Mexican Americans who had served in uh, World War II. Uh, and he was a union man, joined the United Steelworkers and, and went out on strike to get better rights uh, for, um, for his fellow workers and for himself. Now I include him here and I conclude with my grandfather, um, not because his life was extraordinary, uh, but in fact his life was rather ordinary. Um, but it's in this ordinariness that I think we really can uh, see ourselves in history. It's important to have Cesar Chavez and Dolores Huerta and Hector P. Garcia as part of, of the standards um, and, and their contributions. Uh, nobody would question the significance of them. But it's also important to think about how their contributions and how these larger forces of, of history had an impact on everyday lives, on, on people like uh, my grandfather, on people like us, on people like our students. And there's something extremely powerful about seeing oneself in history. And I think this is something that I don't need to tell you about. You know, when your students ask, you know, where, where is my history? Um, to be able to do this allows them to see there, that's my history. Um, ultimately, this is why I do what I do. Um, to, to be able to understand my family's place uh, in the larger tapestry of American history. And I hope that this provides you a way of understanding how, how you can bring that about for your students as well. Thank you. And I realize I also went over time, but it's easier to ask for forgiveness than it is to ask for permission. So. <laughs> We still have, we'll have time for just a few okay. questions if anyone has any. And then of course we'll talk about this more in the afternoon sessions as well, so.
Um, back to your, just thank you for your talk. I asked for this last year. I said, can we have more of this? <laughs> um, I really have a question about my undocumented students. I mean, we have programs for them, you know, to get them into college and things, but I really want to draw them into, even though you're not documented, you still have a responsibility because you're here. Um, what are some good ways to kind of bring that to them? Because a lot of them are like, you know, well, Miss, I don't have papers, or you know, you're still you're still here. And so these are some things that you know I encourage them to work in the community and do volunteer work and that sort of stuff. But what are some kind of I guess some other ways to kind of think with them about that you are here? Right. I, I think that, that that's a very difficult uh, challenge that many of you encounter, and I think it's the, about the reality of our classrooms today. Um, I think one way of doing that, and, and I, I really struggled with using this term citizenship because I think that it falsely assumes that the only way to think about oneself is with relationship to a paper and, and what, what that says. Um, but thinking about the, the cultural elements of, of what citizenship means, it's about belonging, it's about community, right? So how does one... Um, you know, sort of relate to the people around them, to the community of which they're a part, um, and, and what are the responsibilities that come with that, right? That it's not just about what one gets from being a part of a particular community or a particular, you know, group, um, but one, what one can give back. Um, and I think that, that um, you know, at the risk of adding more things uh, for you to, to cover in your, um, in your already full uh, schedules, um, is to think about the ways in which some of these leaders kind of thought about a broader sense of belonging. You know, I mentioned Emma Tenayuka, um, who again, you know, is is uh, you know comes from a much more radical tradition. She um, had been affiliated with the Communist Party. Um, her husband, Homer Brooks, ran for for governor in the state of Texas um, on the Communist Party ticket, but. Um, she kind of thought about the, the broader implications that it, and, and the kind of discrimination that one faced regardless of whether or not they were citizens, right? Uh, Emma Tenayuka is E-M-M-A-T-E-N-A-Y-U-C-A. -E mm -hmm. um, you know, and, and to kind of think about, you know, th those, um, those kind of bigger questions about discrimination and what it means regardless of, of what a piece of paper says, right? And so, I, you know, I, I'm not sure if that really answers your question, um, but to kind of move beyond just, you know, what it means to be a legal part of a community, but what are the other things that, that come with that? And I think that unfolds in, in terms of thinking about, um, you know, things like living conditions, things like social, um, sort of acceptance as part of a community. And so that, that can get students to, to kind of move beyond this, this very rigid notion of, of what it means to belong. Any other questions? Um, was assimilation or the total assimilation of maybe more affluent Hispanic Americans or Mexican Americans um, a problem? such that it makes it difficult as a historian to determine whether um, there were actual um, Hispanic Americans who were involved in the community, but maybe they didn't identify with the Hispanic community, or, um, because I know like there was a story yesterday where um, the lady who gave the speech said that even when you became more affluent as an African American, you face repercussions. Was that the case in, um, for Mexican Americans and Hispanic Americans? Right, so this question of, of assimilation, I think is, is another kind of important one. Um, when we think about civil rights and the different strategies employed by a very diverse community to, to achieve greater civil rights, um, we see that for some kind of appealing to these citizenship rights uh, was that were afforded by legal status was something that was really important. I mentioned the League of United Latin American Citizens, which was founded in the 1920s. Um, you'll notice from the name, um, it, it focused on citizenship, you know, League of United Latin American Citizens. Uh, it emphasized a Latin American heritage as opposed to a Mexican one. Some, 
historians have argued that uh, they kind of represented a sort of middle class bourgeois um, kind of way of, of achieving their own rights at the expense of working class, at the expense of those who, who were, were not uh, of legal status, who didn't speak English. And so they would highlight these things as a means of achieving rights. Um, this, of course, causes friction and tension within the community. Right, I think, and this is it. This seems to be what you're you're asking. You know, did this create tension, you know, within among Mexican Americans? Um, but it also kind of represents a strategy that perhaps worked at the time. You know, again, kind of thinking about them in their historical moment. Uh, there was a new book written by Cynthia Orozco about uh, the the history of LULAC. Um, it's called. It's a great title. It's called No Mexicans no women, no dogs allowed, um, and, and really kind of encapsulates um, the, the period in which LULAC came of age. And, and she argues for a more sympathetic view of LULAC, that rather than being accommodationist and assimilationist, um, that they were being strategic. They were trying to find ways that would work in that particular historical moment. And if that meant rejecting a Mexican heritage, if that meant not speaking Spanish in favor of speaking English, then that's what they were going to do to try to achieve greater rights. Again, people are, are, are highly critical of, of that as well. Um, but ultimately, um, it, it, in some ways, it didn't matter. One could speak the most perfect English in, in some eras in, in uh, you know, in history, um, and be the most "quote unquote" assimilated individual, and still be seen as having just, you know, sort of crossed the border yesterday, um, and and not having those citizenship rights. And so, um, I'm not sure if that answers. Actually, I think maybe I didn't articulate my question mm. very well. And what I was really inquiring about is, does it make it more difficult to? Um, <clears throat> to identify them, I guess, as, because um, I'm sure it's like the attorney um, who argued the um, Hernandez case, never heard of um, And if, you, if I saw a picture of them, I probably, you know, in a textbook, I probably, as a student, as an adult, I probably would associate him mm -hmm. with being Hispanic. So I'm sure my students do the same. Um, does it make it difficult to include them more So being able to find Mexican Americans in history right. is what you're asking. Okay. Um, well, I, you know, again, I think um, the Spanish surname is usually the the you know one of the <coughs> the key things, and also just looking you know demographically um, in places like South Texas. Um, you know, looking at things like the census uh, will give you a sense for the composition of these communities. Um, and the census is also fraught with its own uh, problems in terms of, of being a, a record-keeping um, document. But um, in terms of, I, I think part of the challenge of finding these figures in the earlier periods is that their stories have not been written, that their stories have not been told, that they're the everyday folks like my grandfather, Manuel Gonzalez, um, who may not have done anything extraordinary, but was a part of a, a workforce of which 90% was Mexican origin, Mexican heritage, uh, Spanish surnamed. So I, I'm not sure if that better answers your question. Okay. We have time for one more, and then we'll, we'll break for a few. My question is very, or my story is very similar to yours. I have a uh, Portuguese background. But my question kind of goes with hers too. At what point did Hispanics become white in checking the boxes? Um, well, they were sort of considered to be white in terms of the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, uh, which, which guaranteed citizenship rights for those who chose to take it within, um, I, I believe it was a two-year period of the signing of the treaty, people living in the US Southwest who were living in Mexico and all of a sudden are now part of the United States. Citizenship is, is recognized. They have two years to uh, take the, the US citizenship or to retain their Mexican citizenship and, and move um, 
to the other side of the border. And, and because of how citizenship is conceived of in the United States as being, um, you know, again, predicated on questions of race, um, you know, this is sort of where we see this. Um, and in terms of a self-designation, I'm not quite sure when, when that happens, but certainly in vital statistics records, um, you know, kind of in the uh, early 20th century, when you, when you start getting these kinds of records, uh, things like infant mortality rates and, um, you know, other kinds of, of record keeping uh, going on at the municipal level, this is where we kind of start to see, um, you know, more of this kind of assigning um, Mexicans into this racial category. Uh, but it's not without problems, right? Because again, if you think about things like infant mortality, which you find among impoverished communities and communities without services, well, who are those folks going to be in these southwestern cities? But people living in bodies, people that are of Mexican heritage. And so there's, in the 1930s, there's um, also some, some debates about whether or not uh, Mexicans should be placed into a separate category. And groups like LULAC and other civil rights organizations fighting on, on those grounds as well. So going back to her question, finding the statistics and the people in history probably will be more difficult for us during that time period. Do you have any good resources for us to go back that far? I think the census is a fabulous uh, resource. You know, I've used it in my own research. I've used it in classes. Um, what's really interesting is the 1930 census is the first and only census where a Mexican is, is listed as a racial category. So, um, you know, they, they kind of write in uh, under their, their race, uh, Mexican, and that's where you kind of really kind of see these numbers in, in stark relief. Um, but also thinking about particularly areas that, you know, in Texas, uh, in California, in New Mexico, with Spanish surnames. It's not an exact science, it's not perfect, um, but it gets you at those kinds of, of issues and finding those individuals. Um, there's also tremendous resources in terms of oral histories that have been published. Um, you know, the, the Bancroft Library um, has a, a wealth of, um, of these resources, these testimonios of, of old Californios, people who lived in California prior to it becoming part of the United States, taking you back into the 19th century. Um, a lot of these have been published, and so they're, they're available to you and, and available online as well. Um, and so I think that's another great way of, of getting at these early histories, too. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Hey, thanks.